The dressing rooms of UBC's old auditorium hold many memories for many people. Somewhere on these walls is my name, Mel Atke. For me, it all started here. I made my theatrical debut on this stage in the Musical Theatre Society's production of Anything Goes as the Bishop. But my memories of Mussock go back even further. When I was in high school, I dreamed of someday being in one of their shows. And when this dream became a reality, it ignited the spark of what was to become my career. I lived to join Mussock. I, that's all I wanted to do when I went to university. So I took education. I thought that would be pretty well. I would be teaching, but I wanted to join Mussock. So uh, why did I join it? I've always been nuts about musical comedy. And uh, sincerely, and um, I knew they had musical comedy, so I wanted to join it. It was 63 when I got to UBC. And all right, in high school, in, in the previous two years, I'd discovered I did a school musical of Brigadoon and played a principal part, and that was it. I was thought I was going to be a star and all that kind of stuff. And the way it worked was that the old theater under the stars was still functioning, and it always worked out that Mussock, Jimmy Johnson at that time was the prime director of Mussock, and he was also one of the main directors of Theater Under the Stars, and very often Mussock people would wind up being in the chorus or playing small parts in a Tuts production in the following summer, which is a professional gig. And uh, it was like a route if you were interested in theater, especially musical theater. Uh, Mussock was like a bit of a farm team in a sense for Tuts. Now it just so happened that a year later Tuts folded and that was that ended that, but I was already in Mussock at that point. But that's the essential reason I got to UBC and I knew that Mussock was supposedly on a road to getting somewhere as, as far as performing went. and. Since I thought that's what I was really going to do, uh, of course one joined Mossack, and um, and yeah, that's that was the basic reason. Well, I remember going to the lunchroom where, where we uh, for a meeting. Judy Summer came up to me one day and said they needed somebody backstage, and I said um, I was at Freddie Wood in the theater department. I said, well, I'll come over and uh, talk. And when I walked out of the room, I had just been given the job of prop manager for How to Succeed in Business, which had about 25 scenes in it, office furniture. Apparently, one of the, the per person that they had gotten before had suffered a ner nervous breakdown and couldn't do the, the job. And so I remember Dorothy Davies, who directed the play and David Louie got me in this room and sort of twisted my arm. And that's how I joined Mussock. It got me from, I went from backstage on to stage. The reason I joined Mussock is that I was, I was at the university doing special events and I just um, happened to meet up with some people who were involved in the production of Take Me Along. And I kept going to the um, the uh, Massa Green Room up in the auditorium because I needed a place to eat my lunch. And um, I was always fascinated with being around theater productions and, and musicals in particular. And I, so I just hung around and I happened to play the violin. So I played in the orchestra for the first year and then I started to produce the shows. And so I got very involved in it. I joined Massac because I guess I was brought up on all the was all Judy Garland, Mickey Rooney movies, and uh, I loved musical comedy, had seen a lot of it. My father used to do a lot when he was in university. So I um, sought out Mussock as soon as I got there and loved every minute of it. I joined Mussock because when I was at university, there was really very little to do. So I thought it would be a great thing to be part of. It was, uh, I'd heard it was a fun group. Um, it was a musical society, and I've always been interested in music. They did musical comedies, which uh, was a form of theater that I was very interested in. And uh, since I wasn't in the theater department, it was an opportunity to appear on stage. So that's why I joined. It used to be that whenever I thought of Mussock, I thought of people like Ruth Nickel, Richard Azunian, David Y.H. Louie, just a few of the many people whose careers began here. But now, I think of Grace McDonald, the choreographer who has guided Mussock for 30 years. Grace, 
How long has Mussock been in existence? Well, I would say about 60 some odd years, but don't take that personally. I haven't been around that long. <laughs> How did you get involved with Mussock? Well, actually through Harry Price, because I was doing Theater of the Stars at the time. And when he started to do Mussock shows, he asked me if I'd come and choreograph. I think the first show we did was Student Prince. If I may ask, how long ago was that? Oh, Gad, this is my 30th show, but it's also my fourth retirement. Some of the shows I missed in between, but this is my 30th show with Mussock. There's been some major stars in Canadian theater that have made their beginnings with Mussock. Who were some of them? Well, I, I think that it, most for me, it started with uh, Student Prince, my first show. Milla Andrews, who's well known in opera circles in uh, Covent Garden and Santa Wells and Kelvin Service, who was still probably doing quite a lot of the singing down south. But then of the part, maybe the contemporary area, it's probably uh, Brent Carver, New Ruth Nichols, uh, our own David Y.H. Louie, Bill Millard of the Arts Club, uh, Ed Astley and Sue Beer of Taminus. Uh, you know, you can go on and, and on and on, and practically everybody in town that's to do with theater started at least on the stage here, even our own Bob Allen. In 1965, Pat Rose played the lead in Bells Are Ringing. in love with an overly enthusiastic telephone operator played by Lyola Buns. In 1966's Take Me Along, an 18-year-old first-year student made her acting debut in the role of Muriel McCumber. Margie Kidder's program write-up claimed, everyone tries to convince her that she is beautiful, charming, talented, witty, intelligent, and just plain fantastic, but she modestly holds that she is merely indescribable. In this scene, her suitor Richard is played by Dave Overton, now a theater professor at Dalhousie University. You, young lady, you get to your room and you stay there. Mr. McCombert. You get out. Get out and stay out! Of course, nobody knew then that 12 years later, Margot Kidder would be dancing across the sky in the arms of Superman. There was always a lot of problems working in the old UBC auditorium because the damn place was falling apart. Um, the rigging was terrible. It was a really old building, you know. Uh, in fact, it was quite a bit of a shock. You know, you come out of a high school auditorium, which is reasonably spick and span, and go to the UBC auditorium, and it was moldy. <laughs> the rigging had a nasty habit of breaking. During bells are ringing, uh, there was a big flat, as I recall, there was a big flat flown up in the gallery and the wires broke on it and it was getting towards a final dress rehearsal and this good sized flat that probably weighed about a, a hundred pounds worth or so came clattering down from the flies and landed really within about a foot or so of the entire front line of the chorus including pat rose who was playing the lead <clears throat> like that uh the next year take me along we went out for a lunch break and came back and discovered that the lighting rail had the rigging had gotten all fouled up and the, the lighting bar fully loaded with instruments came crashing right down and went right through the set 
the, the front part of the set. And um, it was around that time, we were getting into the last week before opening, and it was a very, very heavy production. There was a lot of set pieces, a lot of flies, a lot of this kind of stuff. And it was really close to the wire. I mean, really, really close. And then there was this accident. I remember stumbling home from this rehearsal, just really wasted. It must have been about 2 o'clock in the morning, and fell asleep and woke up with this horrible nightmare was that we were already open, we were on stage, and there wasn't a set. That we were all running off stage to paint the set and try and get it on while also doing the show at the same time. I just woke up in a cold sweat, you know. Um, there was always those kinds of things. It was cut very, very close to the, the technical side. We never had that much time, and you had a lot of people to try and orchestrate. Um, yeah, anecdotes, I, I, think, I think the main thing was the, the, the weirdness of, of trying to cope with the UBC Auditorium shortcomings because uh, it was a fun old place to perform in, but it was very old and they had not maintained the rigging and the counterweight systems and all that stuff as well as perhaps one should have, you know. The first show I did was Take Me Along and um, Sue Gibson, who is now Pat Rose's wife, was designing this, the set for this show and at a dress rehearsal, um, while the orchestra was all sitting in the, in the orchestra pit, um, the entire front curtain fell from the, from, the, uh, from the wings, proceeded to fall over on top of the orchestra. And I remember thinking at the time that this was it. And the only thing I could think about was saving my violin. <laughs> so, so I just, you know, saved my violin and got beamed on the head by all this canvas and wood. Um, the other, the other anecdote that is that is interesting is that uh, when we were doing the production of How to Succeed in Business without really trying, um, the, the the fellow who played Finch was is uh, Hank Stinson, who is an actor in Canada, and um, we had two dancers who had come from outside of Massac, um, one of whom was a prima donna of untold proportions, and at the final dress rehearsal, because he wouldn't get a bow he walked out of the show and I remember sitting in the um, in the audience in, in, the, in the orchestra pit and uh, looking up and this guy had uh, just turned his heels and quite literally picked up his bags and moved to a new city and um, everybody was completely struck and dumbfounded and we all looked at Grace and uh, she started to become emotional and we all just stood there and said now what do we do and we spent we spent the eve the, the the rest of the night like this is now at about one o'clock in the morning spent the rest of the night figuring what to do and i at seven o'clock in the morning i'm running around the library trying to find gordon murray and, and jeff hislop and we made them learn the dances that this guy had done in about six hours and they went on the next night so the show went on it was just like mickey and judy time another young performer making her acting debut was Anne Mortifee in 1968's Half a Sixpence. Her program write-up said, Anne is studying English at UBC and looks forward to a career in interior decorating. Perhaps if she'd followed that ambition, she might now be contemplating reflections on crooked wallpaper. In 1969, Ruth Nichol was cast by director Bob Ross for the lead role in Hello, Dolly, but after six weeks of rehearsal, he changed his mind and cast an older actress, Dolores Kirkwood, in the role. Because I was fired, because I had rehearsed as Dolly for six weeks, and then I went back into the chorus, there were only a few numbers left that I could be in. <laughs> and uh, there was one number that I wasn't in because the Grace had already said it, the courtroom. When they say, it only takes a moment, and there was no room. So I couldn't be in that one. So I'd have to sit up in the second act. There was nothing else for the course to do. I'd sit in the dressing room and wait while everybody else would be in this number. And one night I decided, well, heck, why can't I just go and be in it? So I had my little dress on and my hat. And I went down the second act to be in the number. And uh, I think it was Doug, Duke, I can't remember, one of the Dougs was so shocked Oh, sorry, that I would actually try to get on stage. <laughs> and he was obviously not in theater still. <laughs> and uh, I tried to get into the courtroom, into the box. And I was like in awe of going, oh, this is what they're doing while I'm sitting up in the dressing room. And everybody was like very kind of upset that Ruth would come down. And I tried to say, but you guys, I'm really, I had to 
to be down here. And I tried to get in, and I never did it again. The reason the half ass Follies came together was that at that point we had done, each year we had done one great big musical, and there was, seemed to be a, there seemed to be a particular group of people at the time who were very anxious to do more than just one musical a year. And instead of going to university majoring in, in English, um, it came to, to a point, I think it was October, and it was, in, it, it was because of the, the open house that they have at UBC, and Masat decided they wanted to do something, so we decided we would produce a review. And um, I think uh, Ed Astley and myself uh, put together this review that where we stole all the material from everywhere in every possible shape and size and got all the kids together and put on a show. It was a case in point of the students finally getting the nerve and we wanted to direct and produce and and do things also as actors and we wanted to do things that we weren't casting all the time and so David Louis, Ed Astley, Bruce Kellett, myself, it was another, too many directors but we did it anyway and we put it together, we auditioned people, we directed it somehow, we uh, Oh, and Lorraine King choreographed them, and uh, we did those things in between, and then we did Dolly, and then Westside came after. The material tended to be, um, well, we did, a, we did the, the um, cha-cha from In the Rough, and we took some Tom Lear songs and did the, the Vatican Rag, and we, um, we did musical numbers from shows. Um, I think there was a theme, but I don't remember what the theme was, but we tried to hang it, put it together and hang it around a particular sort of point. With Grace, as far as with Westside, I remember... Um, Two, two paces where she, we were working out with the dancers because I had to lead the dancers. There were a couple of dancers who didn't want to be led by me and uh, Grace had to put them in the right perspective because I had to lead them and I had to feel, as an actress, I had to feel that I could lead them. And there was a great psychological thing happening because as a, a non-dancer you have to stand up there and go, I am the best mover and I'm also the best. But I just did it from an acting standpoint so I got through it but I remember one time Grace put me through a certain dance step 12 times in a row. And I just kept throwing myself and doing it. And at the end of the 12 times, as I was getting ready for the 13th time, she just <coughs> called all these, these dancers and said, um, okay, do you see what this girl is doing? And this girl isn't even a dancer, and look what she's doing. <laughs> now, if any of you can do that, half as good as these, you know, what Ruth is doing. And, uh, so it helped because these couple of girls that had been kind of, is she going to be in the front again? They kind of decided that there was something more to do in the, in the musical than just to be, dance well. There was something more to project. And that's what I was trying to do. Well, I guess the, the biggest role that I ever had was action in West Side Story, which was one of the Jets, the guy that survived and took over the Jets after Riff was killed. I was very fortunate to come back uh, later and be able to direct uh, West Side Story, which was um, a tremendous experience for me. It was a wonderful working with uh, what I considered at that time to be just a superb cast, and some of the members of that cast, of course, have uh, gone on to do great things in Vancouver. So, you know. Masak has contributed, heck, Masak has contributed a lot, including the basis of my technique to be in theater. And uh, with the camaraderie and with the, uh, the fun, the fun that you you learn. When you start to learn and there's fun involved, real, absolute wonderfulness of um, doing things that you, are your favorite, things that you enjoy doing and things that you enjoy, and, and you have a family. It, it gave me a technique. It began to be a basis of my technique. It gave me a lot of confidence in myself. It was a great confidence builder because you were working with friends and uh, a group of directors that really cared about the product that they were putting on the stage. It had a lot of support from people. And uh, if enough people tell you that you're good in this business, you tend to believe it. And I think that's what Masai did for a lot of people. Gave them the uh, courage to go on in a business that takes a lot of courage. The most important aspect of Masa that, that, that contributed to me was it gave me an opportunity to do things that I wouldn't normally get a chance to do. Like Masa is where I learned how to be um, a producer of musical theater. Masa was a place where I could 
utilize a lot of, or learn about publicity and what you had to do to, to publicize something. It gave me, it gave me a, a place to, to try out a lot of things at a time, which I, you know, I didn't really know a lot about what I was doing, and so I learned uh, with the experience of Massa. I mean, the experience was the most important thing. I guess mainly it was learning how to play an audience. Learning how to uh, use your eyes, use your whole body to, uh, to convey emotion, to, uh, to really reach an audience. I think uh, that was the most exciting thing for me, was the movement and being able to express yourself through movement. The main thing about Mussoff, uh, and I think a lot of it had to do with Grace's input, was that you really were having a lot of fun, but you were being very, very professional because Grace wouldn't do it any other way. And it was a very, you know, when you were a young kid coming right straight from high school into something, that kind of sense of discipline and that sense of the profession, um, you don't know that's what you're getting until much afterwards. And you realize that you really were very fortunate that you had per a person like Grace there to give you some sense of what you had to do to come up with good work. contribution of Mussock to my career was very much, I think, one of um, giving me the feeling of, of a potential that theater can have on stage for galvanizing an audience. Uh, when you're in a musical and you feel that incredible, I guess, warmth is one word, from the audience that came out at you. Um, of course, a lot of the audience tended to be your parents and friends and things like that. But I remember the first Massac show I was in, Bye Bye Birdie, I just couldn't believe how the audience leapt to their feet at the end of the show and shouted many bravos. And, and that kind of excitement was something that I think it's great to have early in your career if you're interested in theater because there's a lot of pitfalls and veils of misfortune that are going to seek you out along the way. Um, I don't think Mussock uh, contributed to me actually making a decision to go into theater, but it certainly um, gave me that feeling of, of a certain excitement that theater can bring. Part of the success of Mussock lies with its being a UBC social club. But more than that, I think it's due to the discipline and quality which Grace MacDonald has insisted on. Grace has the rare ability to take a novice like me, who can hardly walk down the street without tripping over himself, and make him look like a professional. She drives her performers hard, and results are not attained without anxiety and sweat, but without her high standards, we would not have the large number of Massac graduates who have gone on to careers in professional theatre, film, and television. Thank you.